Hey, welcome everybody to ACO PMR lecture update on regenerative orthopedics. I'm your host, Dr. Ron Torrance, and I'm going to be presenting here for about an hour to give everyone here an update on all the things regenerative orthopedics. So quick disclosure slide, I am a physician for Regenix at New Regeneration Orthopedics. I practice regenerative orthopedics every day, and that's what I do day in and day out. So I'll give you some clinical pearls here along the way, but I'm also on some advisory boards for some functional medicine, Dr. Axe, Food is Medicine, Cresser Institute, and I'm also the supervising physician for the state of Florida for TB12 Sports. So just want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. My objectives here today are what you need to know now about regenerative orthopedics, some of the origins of where regenerative orthopedics came, the science behind the theories and what leads to regenerative orthopedic healing, who's leading today's research, platelet-rich plasma and blood-based products, differences in PRP and differences in PRP that affect outcomes alpha-2 macroglobulin exosomes in the future, best practices for therapy pre and post, MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells. Are they mesenchymal stem cells or are they medicinal signaling cells? The evidence for MSCs or bone marrow concentrate or um, if you can do stromal vascular fraction, whether you should be doing it or you shouldn't be doing it, key clinical pearls, some cases of my patients, what's coming in the pipeline, complementary techniques that enhance recovery, and you know, finding the right provider and current regulations. Quick FYI for everybody out there, we do have an epidemic of pain in this country. Most people in this room are trying to help people get out of pain. Our mission and goal is to get people back to doing what they love. And I don't have to really beat this as a dead horse, but there's some good statistics about 126 million have had pain in the last three months. 40 million have had pain every day for the last three months. 20 million people have had pain daily for the last three months. Severe enough to limit their activities and or ability to work. 54.4 million adults have been diagnosed with arthritis and 23.7 million arthritis tribula activity limitation. So we need more alternatives to keep people from needing narcotics, chronic NSAIDs, steroid injections, and or surgery. And so this is what I'm going to talk about today. Some of those alternatives, best practices, and things to do. If you're on social media, it's like everybody else in the world. These are my social followings. And I am up to date. I got the X. So if you want to jump on there, uh, I'm really, really grateful to be here today and excited to give you guys a little update. Starting with origins, a little sprout there makes me so happy and where everything came from that is regenerative orthopedics. So I like to call this my green road, my green path for regenerative orthopedics, starting with prolotherapy. And I'm going to take a pause real quick, show in the room who does prolotherapy in their practice. All right. Well, prolotherapy was really the original regenerative orthopedics, and it predates steroids. This is when we're injecting high concentrations of dextrose to cause a little irritation and stimulate inflammation. This was done by Drs. Gidney and Dr. Hackett in 1937, and it really has laid the groundwork for what we call PRP, bone marrow concentrate stem cell therapies. So uh, I just want to be, uh, we talked about steroids here, so I'm going to kind of throw steroids in there for a second. I think we should all start moving away from steroids, cortisone injections, knee injuries. Cortisone injections hurt people. And just because it's not, just because it's covered by insurance doesn't mean we should continue doing it. And we should really try to start using alternatives that are better for our patients. And above all, do no harm is my mantra. And I think our, our, what we our Hippocratic oath. So I think we should stop. We should start moving away from cortisone and trying to figure out better ways to do these injections. They can provide short-term relief in some, some cases, in some cases it does really well, uh, but the high dose toxic doses, I think we should uh, sh shy away from them. And Real quick about corticosteroids, here's some evidence, if you, you know, don't believe me that they cause problems. Uh, the JAOS said that uh, short-term treatment of a chronic problem, you're putting steroids in a knee, you shouldn't be doing it. 
Uh, they also further said in 2019 that uh, interarticular steroid uh, does not support interarticular steroids in 2019. And the journal of uh, bone and joint journal said symptomatic uh, injections seem to be associated with increased risk for knee replacement. So from we go from short term for a chronic problem, we say interarticular steroids are also not supported and they actually cause knee replacement. So please don't be doing these injections in knees at this point. I think we should move away from it. And then for shoulders, comparison for PRP versus steroids for shoulders, partial tears of supraspinatus. This article showed that a PRP injection does better than a steroid. And there's a lot of literature to support this. And then I think everybody knows we're not gonna inject a, a Achilles tendon. Why are we gonna inject a shoulder or a hip or burs bursitis? Guys, let's stop injecting things for bursitis. We know that there's a tendon issue typically, and we should look for that tendon issue, and we should be better doctors at that point. So moving down this road, how many people in the audience are using live x-ray every week? Okay, I do. How many people use ultrasound every week? I do as well. We've got lots of ways to guide injections into the right tissues and structures. If you're looking here on the right side of this lecture, or yeah, on your right side, if you're looking at it, that's guiding guidance from an uh, ultrasound into the glenohumeral joint. You're going just below the labrum into that capsule and into the joint. So using guidance, we should all use guidance. I think that this is the time, the day is now that we should do that. But let's talk about where regenerative medicine began. And I usually like to call on the audience here, but since I'm recording this, I don't have an audience to call on, but what do you think regenerative orthopedics means? All right, two seconds. So it's the process of restarting the inflammatory cascade and damage tissue to institute change to reestablish normal function. I tell my patients, what do you do if your phone's not working? If your phone's not working, you turn it off and turn it back on. If your joint, your structure isn't working, what are we doing with regenerative orthopedics is we're resetting the healing cascade for your joint, for your soft tissue structure, trying to reestablish normal function. And in orthopedics, we're going to focus on tendons, ligaments, muscles, joints, meniscus, cartilage, and nerves. So what can orthobiologics do? What can we do with the injectates that we use? We can strengthen tissue, improve stability. One of my biggest theories with knee arthritis is that knee arthritis is due to instability that has been created by some sort of outside injury. And that micro motion starts causing some arthritis of the knee. That's why arthritis progresses. So if you can get that stability back, we're going to help decrease the incidence of arthritis and other, other kind of inflammatory responses. We can heal and strengthen tears and ligaments, tendons, meniscus, labrum, discs, disc, uh, in, um, intradiscal injections. There's a lot of good evidence out there now. Uh, um, Greg Lutz is a really big leader in this. He's at HSS and he put uh, Heal My Back Pain. He's wrote a book. Um, if you're at IOF this year, he, he was there giving signed copies. But there's a lot of good PRP injections in the disc, bone marrow injections in the disc. We can talk about that for days. We're going to decrease inflammation long term. It's going to cause new inflammation short term, but in the long term is what we're looking for for our patients, and that's what we want to do. We can halt the arthritis activity. Sometimes we can revert some damage, and then we improve the overall health of the joint. Okay. So this is how it works. I don't think anybody's probably seen this in the last. Anybody who's a physician here has been in the last five years, they probably saw this with wound healing and that kind of thing. But we cause initial inflammation for you know three to six days 48 to 72 hours i tell my patients and then that blue that green phase is the proliferation phase in the proliferation phase we're stimulating cell growth cell cell lines and after that you can see the neutrophils the macrophages the fibroblasts the parasites the capillaries the endothelium paracrine activity and then really the last phase happens remodeling so we get rapid proliferation of tissues and then we remodel that tissue so that's really what's happening and i you know um, they talk about wound healing here, but I, I think that this is this is a good example of how this is actually working for your tissues and and your cartilage and your uh, your bones and joints. So interventional regenerative orthopedics. What's the difference between regenerative orthopedics and interventional? Well, interventional you add that precise placement, or the orthobiologists are part of the process, 
And that's why I was talking about on the, the green road for regenerative medicine is that we need to precisely guide that. And everybody in this room has probably used an ultrasound or a fluoroscopy for injecting somebody. We should make sure that we call it interventional regenerative orthopedics because we're using precise placement to put the cells in the right place. The shotgun approaches don't work. I mean, they work sometimes, but we wanna make sure that we're doing this the best way possible. And if you do it for your mom, your dad, you're gonna do it the best way you can, right? So I try to do the best injection that I can for every patient that comes through my door. So getting to who's leading today's research, we know that all the usual suspects are out there. Cleveland Clinic, University of Health, Miami Health, uh, if you're you know, uh, the U, uh, Mayo Clinic, Hospital for Special Surgery. And then you got your private sector. That's my practice right there, but they're a bigger group called Regenix. We have 1,300 self-funded insured companies that are covered by our procedures. IOF's a good teaching institute, but nonprofit. They're doing a lot of good studies and research and a lot of teaching. The Orthobiologic Institute has a very good yearly conference as well. Blue Tail Medical Group, Kristen Oliver and her team, all fantastic people. So kind of getting here, we're, we've gone down the green road. We've seen where the, you know, the injections come from, how we do it. And let's talk about the PRP, the platelet-rich plasma. What is PRP? There's some blood. Where's that history? Does anybody know? All right, calling the audience, take a step here. So PRP's history it was first utilized in cardiac surgery. I had to look this up because my colleague thought it was 1998. There's actually cardiac surgery pledgets. They were done in 1987. And then it was introduced in a dental paper. And dentists have been doing PRP for ages. They fill those uh, dry sockets with PRP to make sure they don't get any infections. And then it was introduced in a horse uh, racing paper in 2003. We've had a lot of publications on the elbow and I'll talk about some of those later. And then we have media attention kind of caught hold when Heinz Ward. Does anybody have a Steelers fan in here? All right. If I have anybody in the audience that I know, it's going to be that Steelers fan. They'll know that Heinz Ward got a PRP injection for an MCL. I think it was a grade one, grade two strain. I wouldn't recommend him to come back and play, but it's the, it's the Super Bowl, guys. And sometimes athletes are going to put their health aside to play in the biggest game of their career. So he went back, played, he actually won the MVP and they won the Super Bowl. So it was worth it in his eyes. So how does PRP work? And this is where we get into the sciences. We isolate PRP, we get your growth factors. So when I tell patients, what is PRP versus bone marrow concentrate? I like to tell them hard and fast. The easiest way to say it is PRP is growth factors plus cytokines. Bone marrow concentrate has cells, stem cells, plus growth factors, plus cytokines. So it's got growth factors and cytokines and bone marrow concentrate, but they also have the cells and then PRP just has growth factors and cytokines. So if you want the cells, you need to get the bone marrow concentrate. Anyways, derived from your own platelets, autologous, meaning that there's, they're coming from your own blood and we wanna get rid of those red blood cells, y'all, just to make sure that we're not putting in heme into joints, heme into joints, that heme arthrosis is bad. We all know that. So PRP is injected to the injured site starts that cascade that we already talked about, the healing cycle, all the things that happen there. And then the growth factors, PDGF, uh, tumor growth factor, beta, vascular endothelial growth factor. These are all the growth factors that are key for you know angiogenesis, inflammation resolution, cell migration, cell proliferation. So this is how PRP works. This is how it does, it's chondroprotective. And so the studies that I'm, I'm uh, getting this from actually, uh, pillarish plasma for arthritis, uh, we've got, um, School of Medicine, University of Sao Paulo. Uh, this was in a 2015 journal. Um, and I've got some of the, the sites here. Uh, I'll share the, the PowerPoint and I'm sure you can pick it up from uh, um, uh, Betsy when you guys get a chance. But uh, Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, MRI uh, outcomes after platelet-rich plasma treatment for knee arthritis, kind of looking at this. So uh, here's how it works. So if you look at this knee, so it stops the production of metalloproteases. So metalloprotease production um, is going to really kind of cause degradation. Uh, arthritis causes metalloproteus production. Arthritis then, uh, so PRP comes in and it's an action, a tumor necrosis factor soluble receptor. You come in and stops the production of metalloproteases on the chondrocyte. So then the cartilage is protected. For, uh, so it's, it's chondroprotective um, and it also stimulates bone differentiation. So it increases osteoblast activity and decreases 
osteoclast formation. So you got a lot of good things that PRP does. It also helps with, uh, it's got bioactive proteins for the matrix. So we see that in arthritic knees, cartilage will typically wear away by about four to 6% based on some of these studies that are listed here in the, in the notes. And so knees injected with PRP, there was no change in thickness of cartilage for the majority of patients. So we can say at least it's chondroprotective. If there's no change in the thickness, it protects the cartilage because after uh, they typically aware about four to six percent. If there's no change, so you get net net positive four to six percent. And unfortunately, MRIs aren't sensitive enough to see it, but uh, not not all the time we can see the increase in thickness. So some other players that we can use cytokine rich serums. So A2M, alpha two macroglobulin. This has been this is a big bouncer protein molecule that goes into the joint, and what it does is actually binds up inflammatory molecules. It's a really interesting novel way to maybe put out some fires you got somebody with some autoimmune issues that you got a really big fire i've used a2m before in the past to do this and it, it can calm down an inflammatory uh, response um so that's one of the things uh so some small animal studies uh, our first you know 10 knee oa patients uh, had good results nine out of ten had at least 30 uh, percent improvement um but uh, those are some clinical observations um so I'm trying to use this for maybe like uh, putting people's fires out. Play the lysate. I use this every day, or not every day, not every day, but a lot of days for uh, transforaminal injections, or epidurals, um, or around nerves that are irritated. Uh, play the lysate essentially is lysed platelets, where you freeze the platelet, which releases the growth factors and cytokines. And you can read here what it does, but that's really it in a nutshell. And this can replace the steroid use when you're doing a transferamyl or selective nerve root block, whichever way you call it. And we can do that in and around the epidural space to help with any kind of back procedures. So uh, play the lysate. If you don't have a, a kit or a way to do this, let's talk about it. We can talk about it afterwards and get some questions on how we can get that. So best practice for PRP, as we're talking about it, know what you're injecting. We're not giving antibiotics. We're not giving gabapentin. We're not giving any kind of prescription medication without understanding what's in the medication, right? If I give an antibiotic for uh, for strep throat, it's 500 milligrams twice a day of amoxicillin for 10 days, right? That's the prescribed dose. Well, we're learning and we're continuing to learn what the concentrations need to be to get the best results. So know if it's leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor. Know if it's 10 times the concentration of your normal concentration now, or 20 times concentration. Small joints typically do really, really well with high concentration. That's what I, I see with uh, you know, thumb arthritis. Uh, I'll do a lot of uh, one cc injections at 20 times concentration, leukocyte poor. And I uh, just had a woman come back yesterday who did has been done fantastic. She's got her life back. She's able to open things and she's in her 70s plus and she's super, super grateful. So those are some things. Just know what you're injecting and, and please, please, by all means, use, use guidance. We all have the capability to do it. If we don't do it, we're just being lazy and we're not we're not doing the best practice for our patients. And so this is uh, hard and fast on best practices. What what I've seen in my practice and what we we see a lot of times in the literature as well is that leukocyte poor PRP or, it does really well for cartilage, ligaments, and tendons. If it's tendonitis, tendinosis, PRP all the all day. Cartilage, if it's mild to moderate. Arthritis, we want leukocyte poor. Um, Play the lysate is comparable to steroids around nerves. And leukocyte rich PRP is shown to be better for muscles. I also use leukocyte rich for some tendons uh, and tendons and ligaments too. So I probably put more leukocyte rich there now than I do uh, leukocyte poor. And tell clinicians that measuring concentrations should be above seven times concentration to be considered uh, uh, leukocyte or to be platelet rich plasma. It's not rich if it's only one times concentration. We've seen a number of studies come out recently that aren't platelet-rich plasma. It's plasma, but platelet-rich plasma is what we need to get the outcomes that we're desiring. So the evidence, you know, like Dr. Torrance going on and on about all this and all these studies and best practices, let's talk about it. So here's some injections. I'm sure you guys have all seen these injections, SI joint injections, interdiscal injections, transferaminal injection. We got some facet injections there on the left and interspinous injections. And then we've also got the iliolumbar ligaments. So here's some of the injections that we can do for PRP evidence. Um, one study that's been done at our Regenix affiliate organ was a case series of low back pain. 
And here are some of the images from some of these injections. Uh, this is an extrusion of the disc. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, a year or so afterwards after uh, some one of our PRP injections. So that's uh, one of the uh, images from the study. Uh, you can see here, you can also see how there's a, a nice extrusion here. Uh, I know that some extrusions will resolve. That is that is part of the literature. But uh, if you could have something that helps this resolve faster, would you want it? I say yes. 30, three months of numbness and tingling down the leg is not fun. Uh, we, let's try to help people sooner. So uh, again, another picture from the images. Uh, this is a pretty close image, but you can see a lot of the implant edema and the big herniation here. Uh, a lot more calm down here on the right. Patient was symptomatically much better. Um, this was the, from the case series. Is the, this is the the vast uh, the, the vast scores for the patients before and after. Uh, the one patient was lost to follow up, but we have a zero, 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 one, five, three, two, and one. I mean, those are pretty good results. Um, another study that looks at PRP for spine patients. I know that I'm in a doing a PM&R lecture. So I want to make sure I talk about spine because I see a lot of uh, a lot of PM&R docs who do a lot of spine. So intradiscal, intraarticular facet, transferamen epidural. It's a retrospective pilot study from by Kirshner and, and Tua. And there was significant uh, vast pain reduction. 90.7% showed excellent response at six months. So, um, and then all three structures were injected to the patient. So uh, there's the reference down there at the bottom right. Another study that was recently published, uh, multi-target and biologic injection, Mary Ambach, a wonderful uh, person, uh, her and I uh, taught a class out in Las Vegas. Uh, and, and so she's, this study looked at the inclusion criteria is low back pain greater than 12 weeks, failed conservative measures, oral medications, physical therapy, steroid injections, satisfied for criteria for lumbar epidural, facet, interdiscal, or paravertebral intramuscular injection. Exclusion that can't be Younger than 18, older than 18, older than 80, active infection, neoplasm, any any of your typical exclusion criteria. Now, what we found was we did this, this study looked at whether the person was satisfied or not satisfied when they would repeat the procedure. And so satisfied, there was about, I believe it was uh, the numbers here, it's like 82% of people were satisfied to very satisfied. So doing injections, PRP into the back, and 31, or not 31, not numbers, 38 uh, out of the patients would have repeated the procedure. That that leaves only five, eight patients. So, um, you know, it's a pretty good study. Uh, looks looks pretty good. So this looks at, if you have questions about how to do this procedure, or what to do about it, uh, take a look, pick this up, Regen Med 2022, Jan, uh, January 17th. Uh, PRP is also great for gluteal tendinopathy. It's not bursitis. I was looking up a picture for a patient when I was doing a review just yesterday and I was looking for a glute tendon and it actually pulled up I believe the British uh, sports medicine journal <laughs> and it was exactly this thing it's not bursitis it's probably glute medial tendonitis so if you're injecting somebody somebody goes oh I got the outside the hip pain they come in keep this on on your on your mind this is a really really good well done study randomized uh, double blind control trial for glute tendinopathy if they're greater than four months and they've they've already come to you with a steroid, why don't you put some PRP in there? It's going to do great for them. They're going to be happy. They're going to come back six to 12 weeks later. And they're going to do a lot, lot better. PRP and NEOA. This is a really another another really good study. Uh, completed in 2013. Both PRP treatments had a significantly significant change in KL grade one to two knees out six months. Uh, it was an injection of leukocyte poor PRP, uh, 156 knees, uh, versus uh, versus saline. So uh, really good study there. PRP and NEOA again, meta-analysis of 10 randomized control trials, PRP versus saline and hyaluronic acid, more benefit and pain relief and function at one year out. You may, may be like, okay, well, you know, we know hyaluronic acid doesn't work that well. It's an injection and something to compare it against. So can PRP help avoid knee replacement? This is Mikel Sanchez's study done in 2021. This study was says the data suggests the application of PRP and KOA patients to treatment could delay TKA, although further studies are needed. He did a series of, I believe, five, over five years, PRP injection once a year, and the patients who had PRP injections once a year versus the ones who didn't uh, had a survivorship that was 85.7% um, at five-year follow-up. So uh, that was a pretty well-done study. Lateral epicondylitis, 
This was a cohort study looking at the number of patients from 2008 to 2012 who needed to have arthroscopic surgical release. And what we found was 52 from 2008 to 2012 needed arthroscopic surgical release and one orthopedic practice. And then 17, only 17 needed it uh, over the four years that we they were doing PRP. So showing that PRP was effective and not having that many people go to surgery. Not necessarily the best study, but I think it uh, gets the point across. So PRP for symptomatic tendinopathy, really meta-analysis, uh, 16 randomized control groups, 12 were on lateral epicondyl, epicondyl, rotator cuff, gluteal, and Achilles were also studied. PRP versus control yielded better results. So British Open Sports and Medi Exercise Medicine Journal. So what else can we inject? And this brings me to that point of here. We've, I think PRP, if you're not doing PRP, I think you should be. I think everybody should be doing PRP for our patients, for at least for knee arthritis and lateral epicondylitis at this point. The There are some coverages for some TRICARE companies, but it's very tough to get coverage for that. But I think that it's it's worth it. I think patients would, will pay for it out of pocket if you offer it. So orthobiologics, what can we inject from the orthobiologic field? We already talked about growth factor and rich serums. Talked about, we haven't talked about bone marrow concentrate or MSCs, which we're going to talk about later. Amniotic membrane, they're not stem cells. Just want to make sure that nobody's out there doing FTC violation <clears throat> for advertising amniotic fluid to stem cells. Take a sip of my coffee here. Slow down for a second. So <clears throat> fat graphs, MFAT, if anybody hasn't heard of MFAT, it's a fat graft. Cytokine rich serums, and then we definitely talked about concentrated platelets already. So here's a lot of the things that are out there right now for with biologics. These are the current ones, another kind of look at this and what we're going to see in the future, stromal vascular fraction. Steve Rogers out of San Diego is doing a really good study right now on stromal vascular fraction, and there are some promising studies for that, especially for knee arthritis. Culture expanded. There's a lot of people doing culture expanded outside the United States. Regenix K-Man has a clinic that we do culture expanded. There's also some culture expanded that uh, are, are done elsewhere. Uh, and there's a lot of studies that are showing that really is really, really good for tendons and stuff in, in, in the long time. Other stem and progenitor cells and recombinant growth factors, exosomes. Exosomes right now, there's not, um, it's uh, all hat, no cattle. Uh, there's not a lot of good studies yet with exosomes. There could be some good stuff that coming down the pipeline, but right now there is, aren't good studies. When we're doing these procedures, what we're looking for is allergenic versus autologous. And so we'll talk about that here in regulations in a little bit. But one of the things we want to talk about is allergenic someone else's cells. They can carry bad genes. They can form tumors. Most of the things that I inject are autologous from the person's own body. So that does necessitate somebody having the ability to do blood draws in your office. And that's something that we train and hire for in our practice. So something to think about, but allergenic versus autologous. Uh, autologous definitely by far right now at this point has a much, much better. So Let's pivot here and go to MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, or whether you want to call it medicinal signaling cells. Arnie Kaplan was the person who really, really coined this term. He's the one who coined it way back when. He said there were mesenchymal stem cells. Now he's calling them medicinal signaling cells. And he's rightfully so saying that. But they really do the same thing. So whatever you want to call it, MSCs still got the same acronym. You, you get the injected or implanted MSC. It's anti-scarring, anti-apoptotic, angiogenic, mitogenic, and it has immunomodulatory effects and antimicrobial effects. Activated MSCs are, are great. I mean, they're fantastic. I think that they're by far some of the best cells, and we should definitely be using this. And so if you haven't seen the slide, I really like the slide. Um, and this is from Arnie Kaplan, uh, 2017. So what are MSCs? What do they do? I like to call them the general contractors of the cells. They come in, knock down, get rid of the bad tissue. They bring in, coordinate a symphony orchestra of healing and bring a healing environment to the knee or the, or the, the rotator cuff or the hip joint or the lumbar spine or the disc. And so they essentially are espresso shots for the construction cells to help heal your body. And that's my best analogy. I like it. I stick to it. And they're capable of differentiating into osteoblasts, chondrocytes, adipocytes, or bones, tendons, ligaments, cartilage cells. They stabilize the environment through paracrine activity, and they re release other cells that are crucial in the healing process. So sources, 
at this point, the most reliable source of MSCs without scrutiny is bone marrow concentrate. I'll tell you, hands down, that's where you're going to get MSCs. Now, it's a lower concentration with a lot of other growth factors and cytokines. But at this point, fat, MFAT is not a stem cell procedure at this point. MFAT is a fat graft. And there are some discussions that when you inject MFAT into knees that you are getting some collagenase that breaks down the fat. So then it releases your MSCs, which adipose does technically have higher MSCs percentage-wise, but the, it's very complicated conversation. But I think that bone marrow right now is the best and safest way to do it. We can talk about that at the end if you have any other questions. What does the evidence show for MSCs, for bone marrow concentrate? BMC. I like these slides. They're very pretty. So uh, I can't take credit for this slide. I love this slide. I think it's one of my favorite slides. This is Dr. Don Buford, one of the leaders, orthopedic surgeon, who is a big, big leader in the regenerative side, but also a big leader in the orthopedic surgery side. And this is his slide that looks at you can read it, high level evidence, medium level evidence, insufficient evidence, no, no evidence of efficacy. And some of the best stuff, rotator cuff repair, augmenting a rotator cuff repair with bone marrow concentrate has less retear rate. It's fantastic. Does a really, really good job. Hip osteonecrosis, Philly Pernigal, one of the pioneers, one of the godfathers of regenerative medicine. There are 30 plus years on hip osteonecrosis. So if somebody comes in, you're 30, 40 year old, who's been totally got AVN of the hip. This is a very, very high level of evidence to try to keep that person's native hip. Uh, bone augmentation is something that's required, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Knee arthritis, medium level evidence at, uh, right now for bone marrow concentrate. Knee cartilage lesions, medium evidence. The, uh, lumbar degenerative disc, there was a study that was just uh, released in 2022. I think I listed in here. If I didn't, I may throw it in later on um, if I uh, you know, feel like this, this lecture isn't long enough for everybody. Uh, insufficient evidence, rotator cuff tendinopathy, elbow, elbow tendinopathy. I think that stuff's getting there. It, it does work. It's just one of those things that we don't have enough evidence at this point. So BMAC, bone marrow aspirate BMC, bone marrow concentrate, whatever way you say it, this is a bone augmentation to the left here. And that's where we actually do a genicular nerve block typically and inject into the bone with your bone marrow concentrate. And so some of the stuff, subcondyl injections, talking about Philly Pernigas, this is 2018 study where he looked at bone osteoarthritis. You got a knee like that and same outcome score, 70% preferred bone marrow concentrate. Um, so he had 30 knees, average age was 28 with this osteoarthritis in the knee, right? And you're 28 years old. You're sitting there looking at a knee replacement. There's got to be something better. And these patients preferred the bone marrow, subchondroplasty or subchondral injection or interosseous injection of the knee. So this is an interesting thing to look at 12 years out. They, they went 12 years out with this and 70%, um, same outcome scores and 70% preferred the BMA, BMC. So uh, it was an interesting little study to look at. This is another 2014 study looking at bone marrow concentrate and there were 75 knees, average age was 60. He had about, most people were KL grade two and three and there's a 50% pain reduction at one year. Um, and increase in their function uh, from 38 to 66. So uh, I think those are fantastic uh, results. Good to look at. Something good to, you know, uh, bone marrow concentrate, average age 60, 50% uh, reduction in pain. Another study looking at, this is Dr. Centeno, Dr. Pitts. Um, this is bone marrow concentrate for knee arthritis, average 17-month follow-up. We got an uh, increase by you know, the functional score increase by eight and the pain dropped from four to 2.6. Uh, this is 2014. And I think there's a better study that looked at, this was BMC plus, with PRP plus PL. So uh, bone marrow concentrate plus platelet-rich plasma plus platelet lysate. Uh, that's how Dr. Centeno and Regenix uh, all do most of their knees. So another study by Dr. Oliver, I showed you guys earlier, her blue tail group or blue tail group uh, does a, a lot of research and a lot of studies with bone marrow concentrate. She's also an orthopedic surgeon. I've had her on my Facebook podcast, AKA Facebook lives that I've done. And we had a very, very good conversation kind of COVID time. I was trying to get some interaction with some other clinicians to talk about our findings and 70 knees with BMC and KL grade two, three and KL grade four. I mean, this is a higher, uh, moderate to severe arthritis. And most patients' data was after six months, 11 patients with data to one year with no drop-offs. 
uh, all the scores improved. Everybody got uh, better. This is another follow-up, 2018, average 20-month follow-up. The Womack increased by 8. Pain score dropped from 4.8 to 2.3, more than 50%. So uh, greater than 50% improvement with bone marrow concentrate. That's in the Journal of Arthroplasty. So fantastic little study here. This is Dr. Centeno's 2018 study with our autologous bone marrow concentrate plated products uh, versus exercise therapy for symptomatic knee arthritis. Again, another moderate uh, moderate arthritis, BMC with platelets. Uh, clinical outcome scores improved compared to baseline. 48 patients. This is uh, this is Philip Hernigau's work, and this is Dr. S uh, the, this is doc Dr. Pappas, my colleague, uh, doing an injection into the bone. And we use live x-ray to make sure we're pinpointing and placing these the this subchondral injection. And what he looked at was 15 years later, can we postpone knee arthroplasty? And what his findings were, the study was done from 2000 to 2005. And the study the reports came back in 2020 that there was an 80% success rate in avoiding total knee replacement compared with interarticular BMC injection. So injecting just in the, in the joint with BMC had a 30% success rate. So three out of 10 patients at 15 years uh, avoided knee replacement, which is, isn't bad. I don't think it's great, but 80% success rate. So by injecting the bone, you're going to get a longer term outcome with better results for your patient. And that's pretty much what Herman Gow's work has is, is been showing. Again, looking at this bone marrow lesion, it's, I was talking with a orthopedic sports surgeon and he thinks this just makes sense. I think it makes sense too, based on, it's almost like a subchondral fracture that's not being called a fracture. It's just a degenerative subchondral fracture from whether it was just an insufficiency fracture or something going on in that portion. So what you're doing is you're essentially injecting bone marrow into this area, into a place that needs, it's inflamed and angry. So you're utilizing your body's own cells to help the healing process here. So again, uh, TK on one side, uh, this person got a TK on one side and then did this and uh, they had great results. Um, after treatment with MSCs, uh, the, the BML volume regressed. I mean, look at there, that, that's completely gone. That's a, that's a follow-up MRI. And again, 18% of the 140 underwent TKA. So 82% avoided a no, total knee arthroplasty. Uh, from this procedure. So again, injecting the bone with BMC. Uh, I really love this study. I love this, this this outcome. I mean, you can see here, this is kind of like, it's actually from the study itself. You can see uh, enrollment allocation, 120 knees, the bone marrow concentrate, how much you had uh, 5,727 MSCs per milliliter. Uh, you put it into the bone here, follow up 12 TGAs, 20% or 42 when just injecting the joint. So this was the study. I thought it was great. You want to take a look at it, check it out. Philly printing out. So BMC for the shoulder. Ooh, I like mine. There you go. That's a rotator cuff tear, everybody. Look at that. Look at that guy on ultrasound. You see the little cortical regularity. Also, you can see the hypochogenicity there and the, uh, the supraspinatus. So this is the study I was, I was alluding to earlier with doctors, uh, Dr. Buford's work. We talked about 1.4 to 2.5 semi rotator cuff tears, 150 uh, iliac crest uh, aspiration. Again, this is her, uh, Phil, Philip Herningau's work. And 100% healed in BMC groups, 87% intact at 10 years. So the important thing here is that this was a rotator cuff repair, eight cc's in the greater tuberosity, four cc's at the repair site. So this is what happened. And this is shown that you have decreased re tears in rotator cuff repairs with BMC injected. Now, the best way to probably do this is, in, I, I heard Dr. Shapiro talk about this, Shane Shapiro talked about this one of the uh, one of the conferences I was at, about doing this in post-op, because you don't want to inject into the rotator cuff after you fixed it, because all the fluid that's present, you want to let all that fluid kind of run down and then do this uh, afterwards. So coordinating with an orthopedic surgeon who might not do bone marrow concentrate, this is something I've talked about with a couple of sports orthopedic surgeons, and we're trying to work out, uh, work some patients out for this. So Again, another study with Dr. Centeno et al. on rotator cuff tears with bone marrow concentrate. It's a midterm report, 25 enrolled patients who reached up to 12 months follow-up. Patients reported a mean 89% uh, improvement at 24 months with sustained functional gains. Uh, I could be one of these patients. I had a subscap tear, and I'm doing fantastic. So uh, bone marrow concentrate into the shoulder, uh, loving it. Another study here. Partial rotator cuff cares, BMCs with platelets, the VAS score was significantly different at three months versus ferrotherapy only. We're a little sad that they didn't go further with that. 
Spine, I know a lot of people here do spine. There's a lot of good studies for spine. We got percutaneous injection of autologous bone concentrate. significantly reduces lumbar discogenic pain through 12 months by patine. Uh, we got the treatment of discogenic back pain with autologous bone marrow concentrate, again, by patine and uh, at all, and uh, another autologous concentrate in discal injection for treatment of di uh, degenerative disc disease. Uh, that's a three-year follow-up. So kind of like the progression there. Uh, this is another study that just came out, Matt Murphy. This was the one I was uh, alluding to. Uh, evaluation of effectiveness of autologous bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, the treatment of chronic low back pain, a 12-month open level perspective control trial. Take a picture of this, look it up, uh, Dragala, uh, Matt Murphy's uh, now on, on board with Regenix as well. So um, it's fantastic. It's uh, showing that we we can help people with back pain. So key pearls, guys, key regenerative therapy pearls, key regenerative medicine pearls or regenerative orthopedics pearls. I got to change that slide actually. So take a note there, 78. Okay. So some pearls here. Have a plan on rehab. This is my lumbar spine rehab with unstable spine, maximal protection zero to three days, mental protection day three to week four, three. Uh, I've got some therapeutic exercise, what to do, progress to the next. Don't just sit there and give somebody, hey, go figure it out with a PT, okay? Everyone needs quality physios. I think everyone needs a quality physio. Tom Brady needs a coach. That's why all patients need a physio. So send everybody to a good physical therapist. If you've got a good physical therapist in the office, use them. If you don't have one in the office, find them. They will help your patients get better. Bottom line, end of day, they're going to help you. They're going to help you help your patient and that's worth it. And they may be tight, they may be weak. Um, rec you know, sports injuries, sprains, strains, geriatrics, there's, there's tons of th tons of things that they work on. Core strength, back issues. Core strength is a huge, huge thing for back issues. Candidates for physical therapy, everyone, everyone needs it. There can be, oh, there's multifactorial cases. There's tons of mechanical breakdowns, bio, biopsychosocial. You can just be somewhere there to talk to a patient. Uh, just find a good therapist. They're worth their weight in gold. There can be some chemical stuff. Um, unloading and weight bearing. Here's some kind of pearls. I don't like slinging shoulders after BMC or any kind of injections. I think that shoulders should be sling for one day, and then you should start doing some isometric activities and range of motion. Elbows. If you got like lateral condylitis, you can definitely put an unloader brace on there for six weeks. Uh, and then after that, kind of just let them come out of it. It, it should kind of unload that area. Uh, if you're doing some other elbows, if you're doing like a UCL, you might want to get one of the JJ Watt type braces from Don Joy. Those are some kind of clinical pearls there. Wrist and hand. Depending on what's going on in the wrist and hand, you got a CMC joint and you're injecting it. Give them a CMC, uh, um, a thumb spike, a splint for a few days. Help them at night. You know, that would be good for them. Um, if they've got some you know, non-healing fractures, I've, I've dealt with some of those before. Those actually actually do pretty well with uh, injections. So uh, figure it out and we go from there. Lower extremity ankles and feet. Uh, put somebody, I usually boot people for a week. If it's if it's if I do a lot of work or I have to inject a lot of stuff, maybe I'll do two weeks. But uh, find a good boot. If you do some DME, put them in a boot, put them in a walking boot. Knees, arthritis, unloader uh, very aggressively. If the person has medial or lateral predominance of their joint arthritis, ligament, uh, I'll definitely do some uh, ACL bracing. Uh, I do like a really, you, you want to have a good ACL brace. And hips, we'll have them be on crutches for about three to five days. We're doing that bone augmentation, weight bearing is tolerated, weight bearing is tolerated. Uh, ankle, lower extremity, ankle and feet, weight bearing is tolerated. Spines, uh, I don't like spine braces. Uh, I usually have people start working on core strength and going from there. So I'm um, talking about all that. Ice versus heat. We don't want ice. We want heat. It's something that I think that heat, we're stimulating cells. We're not we're not slowing down the cells that we're doing. And says an aspirin, we want two weeks before and two weeks after. Stem cell minimum two weeks before. And we ideally want six weeks after. I've had some patients we have to work through this and get them on something to help them. Tylenol is a good alternative to use for patients who can't just come off straight off the, the meds. I've had a patient who had to cancel because they couldn't come off their NSAIDs. Case studies, some good little quick case studies. Injuries respond well. We got Tom, hip arthritis. This is not a typical case. I'm going to tell you right now, hip arthritis, usually 50 and above. You, I, I usually recommend 50 and above that, that if it's Severe end stage arthritis. Send them to send them to anterior hip replacement if they can, if they want to stay active. Um, if they're trying to avoid hip replacement at all costs, uh, bone marrow. Um, so right, uh, you guys can read the study. It has a decreased uh, hip external rotation, decreased hip and knee flexion, 
Uh, lumbar had some stenosis, facet arthropathy. So we did a bone marrow concentrate uh, to and with bone augmentation to the right hip. And, and we did a booster, I believe, it, like six months afterwards. And we did some PRP for the lumbar spine. And he's done fantastic. Uh, he's the type of guy who wants more. He was 90% improved after our procedure. But he's the type of guy who wants more and more and more. So he's looking into other modalities for the hip, but uh, responded really, really well. Knee arthritis, this patient is very tall and very valgus, and she had a lot of lateral wear pattern. And this talks about her men meniscus, ACL, and arthritis. She's got uh, extremely bad from femoral internal rotation, pronation of the foot, right lateral knee pain. And so she she avoided a lot of movements. Uh, she has a pot of added, a positive attitude, which I think is a big thing, biopsychosocial, making sure the patient understands this is a uh, going to help them. And we did bone marrow uh, stem cell therapy to the right knee with Prolo and PRP follow-up. Um, patient had PRP booster at three months and continued uh, aggressive uh, you know, physical therapy. She's done fantastic. Uh, she's done. She's one of my favorite patients. I actually ended up doing her left knee and she's done well. There's another, this is a spine patient. You see that kind of extrusion, um, you know, right there at L4, L5, a little bit of herniation at uh, down below and above. But uh, we we hit all the we did TFE at L4 L5 bilaterally with platelets. Uh, patient had pain in the L4 nerve distribution. Uh, was unable to sleep. Stood lay lay comfortably. Uh, six weeks of recalcitrant conservative therapy. Um, no real back pain. He was just really having more ridiculous symptoms. So we got him there. Uh, got some TFEs, and I also hit the facets to stabilize the joint. We 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 believe in more of a functional spine approach. You can find that in Chris Williams' work. He's got a really good paper from on Curis for cervical spine that's talking about 14, 14 series case study. So check out that. Another shoulder, got uh, one of my patients, uh, CrossFitter, loves to be active, shoulder, glute, adductor cuff, elbows, lower leg muscles. So this is, this is my uh, PT friend of mine, pain in left shoulder, active range of motion, flexion, adduction. Overhead movements bothered him. Positive test. Active range of motion, but not pain free. M MRI showed uh, inflammation on the bursa, biceps tendon, and supraspinatus. Pasta lesion present, tendon, and supraspinatus. We did this PRP to his uh, supraspinatus, biceps, and capsule, and he's done fantastic. He's back to completely normal on the left shoulder. Anecdotally speaking, he's actually come to see me for his right shoulder now, and the previous patient, too, with the knee also came to see me for her other knee. So, uh, what we do is interventional regenerative orthopedics, everybody. And these are some fun injections to look at. This is the ACL injection. And really going into this ACL, if we have a part, uh, grade one, grade two, or grade three partial tear, that's something that we can definitely do to help out our patients. Um, grade three, non-retracted. Uh, this is what we've seen in some follow-ups. So this is uh, some novel in injections. This is uh, the IO injection for the going in the bone for this uh, this lesion here in the patella. Um, this helps a lot. I've seen a lot of patients with knee uh, patellofemoral arthritis, and they have a lot of these bone marrow lesions. This is the lumbar ligaments, I think I discussed this earlier. Got the superior labrum here. And so that's a, under floral, right? So I use live x-ray, uh, ultrasound to get there, and then I, I use live x-ray to check on that. So it's a pretty, I love using that. So how can we learn more? How can someone learn more who's interested in regenerative orthopedics? Uh, what I would tell you is some nonprofits do a good job. Interventional uh, Orthopedic Foundation, IF meets in February. Typically in Denver, it's actually was in Phoenix this past year, so we need to change that slide up. And then Orthobiologic Institute meeting in June, Chicago usually. And then um, I think they're meeting in Fort Lauderdale this year. I'll have to change these slides. Uh, just make a note to that. So if change slide uh, 99. Uh, location of meeting okay and then aaom is in uh, meets in denver a lot of times but i'll find out those things so i'll check change the locations so what can be used to treat my patients as with the fda's guidelines I'm sure everybody wants to kind of hear what what the fda is kind of saying so how does the fda regulate human cellular tissue products this is kind of my regulatory slide so if you guys want to make sure or everybody here wants to know if they're in the clear or not in the clear FDA regulates stem cell treatments as human cells, tissues, and cellular tissue-based products under Title 21, Part 1, 1, 1271. And exceptions of regulation discussed in 20, 21 CFR 1271.15B. 
How does this FDA regulate human cellular tissue products? Two parts that are relevant to today's discussion. 361, section 361 regulates the use of body tissue and must be registered with the FDA. Purpose is to prevent communicable diseases. Requires registration with the FDA. Section 351 regulates tissue and living cells that are manufactured and therefore regulated as a drug, device, and or biological product. Requires pre-market approval subject to the applicable drug regulations. Exception to 361. Section 361 is an important exception. The agency would not assert any regulatory control over cells or tissues that are removed from a patient and transplanted back into the patient during a single surgical procedure. Communicable disease risks, as well as the safety and effectiveness risk, would generally be no different than those typically associated with surgery. Tissue is not regulated at all by the FDA if it is used in the same patient during the same surgical procedure. No more than minimum manipulated and for homologous use. So same for same. Bone marrow for bones, bone marrow for cartilage. These are all same for same. That's the healthcare attorney's interpretation of these exceptions. Not allowed versus not allowed. I'm going to give you my list of allowed versus allowed, not allowed from our interpretation, my interpretation, and we'll go from there. Bone marrow concentrate, allowed, not under FDA regulatory control, exempt from Section 361, not regulated by Section 351, as long as minimally processed and placed back in the same patient during the same surgical procedure and used for homologous use. That's me doing a bone marrow aspiration. How does the FDA regulate human cellular tissue products? So, not allowed. Stromal vascular fraction regulated as a drug under Section 351. The act of breaking apart the fat to get the stem cells requires an external enzyme, which is therefore considered more than minimal manipulation. So, stromal vascular fraction. We are doing studies on it. So, if the studies come through and they come through through phase three clinical trials and it gets approved, then we will be we would be in the clear. So, this is something that is being done right now and could be beneficial in the long run. M fat allowed to make, but homologous use is in question. This is something that is pretty much clear as mud as I'm putting up there. Peter, what's his name? Not Peter Hunts. He was the head of Sieber, and I'm not, I'm drawing a blank right now. But the head of Sieber said, "Hey." Um, Fat into a knee is not homologous use. That's what he said on uh, essentially on a, uh, a presentation that he gave. So take it with what you want. There is a fat pad in there. You could argue that um, they're not coming after people with M fat typically or anything right now. So um, how does a regular select tissue products? More culture expanded. That like culture, is that seen culture and things, not allowed. 2011, they came into Regenix and they told Dr. Centeno and Dr. Schultz that you could not be culturing cells in the United States. Uh, that's been done. Now, there are some studies that are looking at this too, culture expanding cells. And if we get that approval for interdiscals, then possibly there's some uh, some off-label usage. All right. This is a slide. Uh, again, I'm sorry it's branded, but uh, I think it's a really, really great slide to look at. So if you want to take a picture of this or anything along those lines, um, tissue, no FDA approval, bone marrow, nucleated cell isolation, stem cell fraction, you can read it. Bone marrow, mesenchymal stem cell culture, drug needs FDA approval. Fat, liquid, adipose graft, tissue, no FDA approval. Again, that's that that's that M fat, and that's we call it AD. So fat, liquid, stem cell, stromal vascular fraction, that's where your stem cells live. It's a drug, needs FDA approval. And then mesenchymal stem cell culture, adipose. You can also do adipose. So there's three different types of fat stem cell processes and the bone stem cell processes. So that was a really good slide. And I, sorry, it's got a brand on it, but um, just ignore that. Birth tissue product regulation, fetal stem cells, illegally used in the United States outside of research. State laws require regarding embryonic stem cells very widely. Florida statute, no person shall use any live fetus or live premature infant for any type of scientific research, laboratory, or other kind of experimentation. So don't use them. And quite frankly, all the products sold in the United States are tissue products regulated under Section 361. None of the products in the United States have been uh, contained living cells and independently tested in multiple labs. And amniotic, placental, or umbilical cells regulated under 351 as a drug. Only cord blood stem cells approved after my, for myeloblative treatments. Um, so these are just kind of, again, more regulatory stuff. I'm not a regulatory guy. You want to talk to your healthcare attorney if you want to follow up on this. Consensus statement in 2019 that I was part of and I made a signature was the aggressive marketing approach currently used by practitioners and clinics regarding various birth tissue products is safe and effective stem cell therapy is not supported by the existing literature. The late Jerry Malenga, uh, 
really spearheaded this project and uh we were super grateful to have him and um unfortunately he's passed but uh um, this is this is one of the things that i remember him uh, being very involved with and making sure that everybody knew take home message we are capable of reducing the use of corticosteroid injections at this time prp use is good for tendinopathy small tears mild arthritis bmc bmc alternative management strategies for moderate to severe arthritis in most joints and beware of the rep who wants to sell you on stem cells. There is a there is a Medicare rack going on, and people are being asked to give a lot of money back for the Q code that they might have billed. And if you're if you know somebody like that or who's doing that, um, make sure that you know, you know wish them well. Summary: Help millions of people who are non-responders traditional orthopedics. There's a lot of RCTs coming out. There's more. There's more RCTs for. PRP than there are actually, I believe for uh, Dr. Centeno talks about this all the time. He's always posting about, he's got his, his little studies looking at all the different areas. If you want to check out his stuff, you, you're welcome to. Um, if you're interested in more information about redoing regenerative orthopedics, please feel free to contact me. And thank you so much for letting me be here today. And I'm excited to really present on October 7th and field your questions. Here's a question in social media information. Most of my stuff was cited on the slide, so I don't have a uh, references page, but if anybody has any questions, there we go.